Welcome back to my course, uh, Russia after 1917. Uh, today we are going to talk about so-called uh, the, uh, the Gorbachev period, the time in the history of the Soviet Union when this um, dictator, age dictator, um, who presided over Soviet Politburo named Leonid Brezhnev died in 1982 and what happened between uh, 1982 and 1985 when Gorbachev uh, finally came to power a young one quote unquote because he was relatively young compared to those um, um, individuals 10 individuals who were part of Politburo and who uh, presided over the Soviet Union okay before eventually Gorbachev was chosen there was this interim period, a period of uh, uncertainty. Last time we found out that uh, one of the reasons why the Soviet Union started to decline was the inefficiency of the communist system that uh, was the product of the martial age, the age uh, of extremes, when uh, Soviet people needed to be mobilized for different type of causes. And as you know from history, and I made it, I kind of hammered this point in your minds that history shows us that any emergency situation, and especially uh, the situation of warfare, especially prolonged warfare, creates uh, good conditions, favorable conditions for what? For tyranny authoritarianism or to the abuse of power by the central government and it happens naturally nobody plans it uh, from up above it happens because it happens because the emergency situation pushes people to and the government and people themselves to accept um, martial methods mobilization methods and the history of the Soviet Union shows that um, Modern history and the march of the old history of Russia was um, filled with these periods of emergency. Okay, uh, two world wars. Uh, Stalinism was pretty much product of these two uh, wars, which Russia, uh, Soviet Union had to go through, and this system started to crumble in the time of peace, in the time of prolonged peace. It showed its inefficiency. It showed that it could not satisfy the needs of consumers, the needs of society, and it started gradually to collapse. It didn't happen overnight. It um, happened gradually, extended in time. Why? Because, remember, I made another point that Soviet Union was able to sustain itself by using natural resources, abundant natural resources. Soviet Union was blessed with rich natural resources, which uh, she was able to sell abroad to the Western countries, particularly oil resources, gas and gold. These three items sustained the welfare society in the Soviet Union. When the government reached this silent agreement with society, you don't complain about this um, uh, authoritarian regime and in exchange we provide you uh, minimum um, satisfaction okay basic items food items were subsidized subsidized housing subsidized medicine and subsidized schooling that formerly was open to everybody again i repeat it was uh, entire society existing on welfare okay and this society started to slowly crumble. In addition to the inefficiency of this system, because Soviet economy was totally centralized, remember, there was no room for any uh, private or individual initiative, because everything was controlled by the government, beginning from a big um, industrial factory or industrial enterprise, and ending with some small dinery or small workshop which belonged to the government 
which all of them belong to the government, all food stores, any kind of retail stores. So that is why um, people were not uh, encouraged to express the initiative because they didn't have this sense of uh, ownership. And unavoidably, it, um, in the late days of the Soviet Empire, it contributed to the rise of so-called black market when many uh, unaccessible items were sold and resold at the black market, including cars, including all kinds of foods, records, all kinds of items that were not available in uh, the Soviet stores. So that's one factor, this inefficiency of the Soviet uh, system of centralized planning, centralized planning. There was no room for any private initiative. But the second reason also that killed the Soviet Union was the arms race. Remember I mentioned that uh, Soviet Union had to compete with this big industrial giant called the United States. Okay. In terms of economic potential, United States, of course, um, <clears throat> overshadowed the Soviet Union. The total uh, budget, uh, military budget of the United States in 1980s was between um, 8 and 9 percent of uh, GNP. Okay. The Soviet Union had to spend up to 40 percent, 4 zero, up to 40 percent of GNP to subsidized her military okay so now you can understand how unfavorable it was for the soviet union to operate uh, these competitions and eventually this military competition reckless uh, interference of the soviets in afghanistan 1979 when 100 soviet troops were sent to back our unpopular Marxist regime in Afghanistan that was opposed by the majority of the Muslim population. That uh, totally ruined the um, uh, Soviet economy, the inefficient Soviet economy. It was hard for the Soviet Union to keep up with this war, with this military expenses in Afghanistan. Simultaneously, the Soviet Union had to subsidize numerous satellite countries competing with the United States for the Third World, Soviet Union provide um, huge military support and um, in-kind food support, uh, in-kind support with all kinds of resources to you know, such countries as Libya, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, you name it, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Egypt, Syria. And many, many, Cuba, of course, you name them, a lot of countries. And of course, it uh, was a huge burden on uh, the Soviet Union. Eventually, it ruined the Soviet economy. Okay. And then uh, we ended last conversation by stressing that uh, this aged uh, Soviet leader named Leonid Brezhnev, who presided over this um, period of stagnation, remember the whole period, Brezhnev period, from 1964 to 1982 was known as the period of stagnation when the soviet economy was slowly but surely was stagnating hence the name stagnation when brezhnev died it created this uh, situation of uncertainty because uh, this uh, soviet tradition of having one leader for a long time that controlled at least formally uh, the whole situation um, uh, created this uh, sense of um, vulnerability even among the many soviet citizens although a lot of soviet people were so fed up with this uh, person who wasn't cruel basically who um, closed his eyes on the spreading corruption in the soviet union but at the same time uh, who tried to pose as the great charismatic leader, which he was not, of course. A lot of anecdotes, a lot of jokes existed about Brezhnev. And I remember from my personal experience, it was very sad to observe how uh, before he died, uh, his um, communist court, quote unquote, tried to pamper him, tried to give him different awards. And it was really um, sad to observe how uh, the aged man who had should be retired a long time ago was literally pushed up to the top of the political pyramid, and it was I felt even sorry for him when other people uh, made jokes. Again, uh, 
the situation with Brezhnev reminds me something that was going on with some of our <laughs> present day candidates to the presidential position, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, but anyway, I don't want to go there. Um, after he died, there were hardly any other candidates available because entire Politburo, these 10 men who can oligarchy that controlled the Soviet Union, all of them were in their 70s, in their late 70s, because all of them had reason under Stalin. Okay. Of course, in uh, any totalitarian or authoritarian state, again, I call the Soviet Union during this time an authoritarian state because it was not anymore the totalitarian empire created by Stalin, okay, where everything was controlled and people were um, living in fear. So it was, Soviet Union was a partially decomposed totalitarian dictatorship. So the best way to describe uh, this was to call it an authoritarian state. Anyway, there were hardly any fresh blood to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> be promoted to the top of this pyramid. Uh, uh, in any authoritarian state, uh, who was close to the top when a leader uh, dies, it's a chief of the secret police. And at that time, the chief of the secret police was um, uh, Yuri Andropov, longtime chief of KGB, Soviet secret, secret police. So he... Um, <clears throat> he was presiding over the Soviet Union. <clears throat> what he did, he uh, quickly got rid of all Brezhnev cronies and uh, decided to curb the corruption. So an attempt to somehow um, eliminate this black market corruption in the late Soviet Union and uh, something that... Uh, upset uh, purists, purists in the Soviet regime. Although, I repeat, the Soviet Union was so uh, infestated with corruption, it was hard to get rid of this. He, won he believed Andropov as a chief of the secret police. He knew that Soviet economy was not functioning well. But he thought by um, disciplining people, by lining people up, um, forcing them to work somehow, he would be able to regenerate the Soviet system, okay? And that, uh, that is why right after he came to power in 1982, he started to arrest those uh, corrupt communist bureaucrats who flourished, who created their own clans in Soviet republics. Uh, for example, the most prominent case was so-called Cotton Mafia. It's a Muslim, this... Muslim republics of Central Asia, headed by corrupt communist officials. There was a mafia, literally mafia, when local communist bosses, they closed the eyes on the um, private um, uh, factories created underground that uh, processed uh, cotton, uh, sold uh, the black market cotton materials and exploited the uh, uh, the labor of students, um, uh, public school children at the cotton fields. Uh, instead of actually opening a private enterprise, uh, Andropov decided to crack down, to penalize these people. So he arrested these communist bosses, uh, put them in prison. He started to crack down on work absenteeism. So I see I highlighted it in my um, PowerPoint here, work absenteeism. So uh, what happened, um, a police, regular police, was ordered to check the documents <laughs> of people during the day, you know, from uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. when everybody was expected to be at the workplace, okay? And randomly, police checked your documents and asking you why are you, uh, what are you doing, why are you uh, uh, philandering, wandering around, um, away from your work so if you couldn't provide some documents like for instance you were on a business trip or it was related to your work you could be detained you could be questioned and um, it created a lot of um, i wouldn't say fear but uh, something uh, uncomfortable feeling 
among the people that remind them a little bit of old uh, day Stalinism. Although people were not thrown into prison, they were normally fined. They had to pay a fine. If, for instance, instead of um, going to their work, they went to a movie theater or were hanging around uh, trying to sell something on the black market. So that was uh, the most widespread practice. That, uh, again, <coughs> reminded some of the curfews when in some countries today <laughs> we do for reason of course because of this coronavirus when uh, the police in italy for instance in italy in uk uh in occasion in some states in the united states they stop people and um, ask them why don't they observe this sheltering policies so something like this only in the case of soviet union it was done during the um <laughs> <laughs> in opposite way so the government tried to force people to be at work because people tried to stay at home or uh, to go to the black market to do some of their shady deals to survive somehow so here we try to keep people at home <laughs> but at that time Andrup have tried to keep people at work anyway uh, he realized he finally uh, he realized that his policies didn't work he personally realized and his uh, KGB secret police officers told him that people uh, made fun of this again people made um, made any um, shared anecdotes about him essentially people were not in fear anymore so they didn't take it seriously a lot of people ignored these restrictions okay didn't care about them, I continued this black marketing and the uh, police itself was involved into this and he couldn't do anything. And eventually, by the end of his life, he was deadly sick, he had a kidney disease. He realized that he did need to give some room to private enterprise, uh, at least a limited room for private enterprise, like, for example, in Yugoslavia or in Hungary. And he started thinking what he could do in this respect. And in fact, it was Andropov, Yuri Andropov, this chief of the secret police, who promoted Mikhail Gorbachev. He took him from southern Russia, where Gorbachev was one of the local party bosses, brought him to Moscow, introduced him to his uh, aged friends, colleagues, Politburo, and eventually, uh, because of him, because of Andropov, Gorbachev was appointed to a a deadly position, I call it a deadly position, to be in charge of the Soviet agriculture. So Andropov believed maybe Gorbachev would be able to do something in terms of agriculture. But before uh, Gorbachev uh, became the general secretary of the Communist Party, after Andropov died in 1983, another man was appointed from Politburo. So they were not ready yet for a young, fresh blood. Konstantin Chernenko, another feeble man. He was a Brezhnev man. He was a Brezhnev chronic who himself was uh, involved deeply in corruption, who loved to be corrupt and um, wanted to continue this policy, stagnation policies. He also was deadly sick. He suffered from severe asthma and he even needed assistance to work. He was kept from both sides when he was walking around by two bodyguards. So he dies, he dies in a year, and that's when Gorbachev comes to power, who already had been appointed by uh, Andropov to be in charge of the agriculture. Okay. Gorbachev indeed was a, a fresh blood. Although he was a communist by his convictions, he believed in, um, I wouldn't say social, uh, I wouldn't say communism, but he believed in socialism. Okay. Remember, uh, socialism is like a soft version of communism. Uh, he indeed was a fresh blood. He studied law at the Moscow State University. He, um, unlike these people whom I mentioned, Chernenko, Andropov, and many, many others, who never had any college education, Gorbachev was the one. For the first time, by the way, since uh, Lavrenti Beria, who was the chief of the secret police, now the Soviets had in the leadership a person with a university education. At least it polished him, it gave him this um, uh, broad view of the world, not, I wouldn't say, cosmopolitan view, but at least he could uh, exercise some critical thinking. 
and he studied law at the Moscow University, which was important, even though it was like crippled, uh, like a socialist law discipline. That's what he studied. Still, it was law, and he was taught to uh, observe the laws, you know, which <laughs> was important. And uh, from his I interviews, it was clear that he was. Uh, from early on, he was shocked at how the Soviet Constitution wrote down certain rights of people, freedom of speech, um, freedom of press, and many other human rights. And in reality, it was never observed. So he kind of, as a legal um, expert, he could not reconcile somehow this with his uh, socialist view. But the most important thing, he matured during the Khrushchev thaw. Remember Khrushchev thaw? when Khrushchev made the first attempts to crack down this Stalinist totalitarian dictatorship. And he did before he was ousted by his comrades. Okay, So even though he was under his protégé, appointee, under his appointee, he eventually was done he comes to power. He comes to power and like um, uh, Andropov, he was torn apart since he was his appointee. He was torn apart by this um, desire to reform the building of communism. At the same time, he was concerned about the safety of uh, the communist ideology. Okay. And like Andropov, at first he tried to crack down on uh, people's um, lacks discipline so he uh, he introduced so-called dry law he thought that um the cause the root of this absenteeism or workers absenteeism was the rampant um, alcohol consumption in rush so he introduced the strict dry law which again was ignored by people who did this moonshining who were selling alcohol black market the situation reminded very much what was going on in the United States during so-called dry law. I remember in 1919 in the U.S. they adopted the dry law, which was uh, repealed by FDR in 1933. But in between, there was a lot of um, illegal uh, moonshining, illegal smuggling of alcohol. And the same situation flourished in the Soviet Union, and he could not control uh, anything. Okay. He tried also to exercise discipline, disciplinary measures, which didn't work out. Yeah, that's when he resorts to new methods. Okay. Um, before I will tell you what kind of measures he eventually adopted, I would like to show you this cartoon, which I always show to my students um, to make a point. And my point is that Gorbachev did not uh, have any plan in his mind some kind of refor grand reform he wanted to do. He simply um, uh, went preceded by, um, by trying things, by experimenting with things. He was, a con he was a true believer. He was a true believer. He believed in socialism. He didn't believe, of course, in Stalinist version of uh, socialism, but he believed that socialism, it was the great future. But... Um, on the job he was doing this on the job learning and the more he learned about soviet economy the more he learned about the soviet regime the more uh scared he was becoming so he was discovering for himself what he didn't know about okay by reading more about how stalinist dictatorship was functioning and eventually he decided to liberalize this regime why? Because he, right, like Khrushchev, he believed that if he would liberalize the communist system, he, he would make it stronger. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> because he didn't know that communism or socialism, for that matter, it was um, uh, essentially a dictatorship. It could be a soft dictatorship, like in some countries, but it could be a strict dictatorship, like in the Soviet Union or in, in China. But as soon as you begin to reform this dictatorship, you eventually collapse. Okay? And that's why I show you this cartoon where this hammer and sickle breaks apart. It shows that he didn't mean it. That's what he, I didn't mean it. But that's what he did. Okay.
because there was no other option. He couldn't go the Stalinist way. He could not uh, follow Stalinism in the 20th, at the end of the 20th century. It didn't work. It didn't work out. And he realized that Stalinism was a dead, was a, was a dead um, system. It couldn't be applicable anymore. Okay? He could not make Soviet economy efficient. Uh, another reason why he started to experiment eventually with market reforms uh, was simply because he believed that by um, injecting elements of market within the Soviet system, he would somehow revitalize Soviet um, military industry and eventually would make Soviet Union more powerful in terms of military. So see, he was uh, thinking that by doing these reforms, by instilling market elements of market uh, within the Soviet system, he would be able to make um, uh, Soviet Union compete with the United States. Okay, so Gorbachev was a true believer. Of course, by the end, uh, right now, for instance, he is still alive. He um, underwent a deep transformation, and I don't think right now he is a committed socialist. He is. Um, uh, he could be called more as a Keynesian or a person who tries to combine elements of capitalism and socialism. That's his convictions right now. A social democrat. That would be the best way to describe him right now. Okay. So Gorbachev eventually became social democrat in the process of these reforms. In fact, at some point, I'm jumping ahead when he already lost his power in the 1990s. He tried to create a social democratic party. Uh, in Russia, but he failed. <clears throat> so Gorbachev was a new fresh blood, realized that disciplinary measures didn't work. Uh, like Khrushchev, by the way, he tried to mingle with common people. He was an outgoing person. He tried to shake hands. And another important thing, he tried to break away from this patriarchal uh, tradition of the Soviet uh, male leadership when these Politburo members or top uh, and actually all communist bosses they were hiding their spouses somewhere or kept them at the backstage okay they were no there were of course some women a few women by the way in the Soviet leadership Khrushchev I forgot to mention appointed uh, the secretary of culture minister minister of culture Soviet culture uh, a woman for the first time, who was also made a Politburo member, okay? But um, all in all, uh, if we take into account entire Soviet um, communist bureaucracy, the tradition was to keep the spouses aside on the sidelines. And Gorbachev was the first uh, Soviet leader who actually um, treated his wife as a partner, who traveled with her during uh, his trips all over the country. Uh, who opened in front of other people, ask ask her her opinion, what do you think about this? And the people encouraged people to ask her questions when he mingled with other people. So a lot of uh, Soviets all over um, the Soviet Union saw him along with his wife. Um, I repeat, frequently he showed up with her trying to break away from this uh, patriarchal tradition, which I repeat, did not exactly help him because I have to stress this um, a large part of the Soviet society, especially in Muslim areas, Central Asia, in some parts of uh, Russia, in the countryside, there was still a lot of this, I would say, uh, an old um, traditional patriarchal culture that looked with suspicion at the, those males who tried to. Uh, be equal to their uh, female partners or spouses okay so that is why i remember from my experience when some uh, uh, i would say some russian traditionalists or some uh, uh, redneck russians let me put it this way said oh why does he bring his wife it's no good you know this kind of stuff although uh, people in, who lived in cities, uh, people with college education, people who um, worked in uh, some people who worked in factories, they welcomed this. They said, oh, it's good for the first time. Finally, yeah, women, of course, liked it. Um, interesting. Jumping ahead, I want to say that uh, Gorbachev was able to secure a lot of love outside of the Soviet Union. 
but inside of the Soviet Union to the present day he is mostly hated by a lot of people not only by these uh, uh, redneck um, traditionalists who wanted to bring back this patriarchal tradition no no not necessarily but uh by so um by many people who originally sympathized with him why because right now uh he's blamed by many russians who feel nostalgia for the soviet union that he purposely <laughs> from up above somehow um destroyed the soviet union that's what a lot of um, russians unfortunately believe to the present day Okay, it's a widespread public opinion. If you, in terms of percentage, um, uh, no more than fifteen percent like him. Okay, but all public opinions give him uh, lower grades. Even some intellectuals uh, don't like him because they thought that oh, he would have been able, maybe, to save the Soviet Union, but he didn't. He is portrayed as the weak leader who uh, weakened the Soviet Union. And of course, some conspiracy theorists, unfortunately, you don't know Russian. Um, but uh, even in English, the, it exists in um, uh, YouTube space. Or if you Google it, like Gorbachev, destruction of the Soviet Union, you will see a bunch of conspiracy theories which I repeat, popular uh, uh, among some conspiracy buffs in present-day Russia, that Gorbachev was a puppet of CIA, Jews, and, free, and Freemasons. That's, <laughs> that's the, the favorite trope of these conspiracy buffs, you know, in the present-day Soviet Union. Okay. <clears throat> Gorbachev initiated the uh, popular reforms that became known as perestroika which means restructuring it's um, related to economic reforms within the soviet union and second thing uh, another word uh glasness glasness which means openness it's uh, lifting uh, of the soviet censorship so he lifted censorship he didn't declare freedom of speech right away but he had to do it eventually by the end of the Soviet Union. But first, he simply uh, lifted censorship and allowed uh, a wider criticism and again, again, the space for the freedom of speech uh, was uh, been gradually increased, increased up to the freedom of speech at the end of the Soviet Union, 1991. It was uh, became the counter of essentially free speech. Okay, which is not the case at the present day Russia, by the way. So he declared glasses. We need to be more open. We need to lift censorship. <clears throat> As I said, he didn't have any clear plan. Um, his major goal was how to make communist economy vital and vibrant without destroying the building of communists. It's very... Uh, he, you cannot resolve this task, okay? But he didn't know it because he was the prisoner of his, he was still the man of his time. He was the prisoner of his ideas, even though he was a reformed socialist. I forgot to tell you that he sympathized with the Prague Spring. Remember in Czechoslovakia in 1968, the Czech communists had made an attempt to build so-called socialism with a human face. So democratic socialism. Okay, in this experiment was cr crushed by the Soviet tanks, but Gorbachev loved this experiment. Of course, he couldn't openly say about it. And where did he learn about this experiment? When he was a, a law student, he lived in the same dorm with one of the leaders, with one of the future leaders of the Prague Spring named uh, Zdenek Mlinarz. It's a Czech name, Zdenek Mlinarz, who later, after graduating from the Moscow State University, um, became one of the uh, chief leaders of the Czech Communist Party and one of the spearheads of, of this um, uh, project, Socialism with a Human Face. So they talked about liberalization of communism. So he was um, a person, Gorbachev, who um, sympathized with democratic socialism. <clears throat> but again, um, his... Uh, mantra was still the same Stalinism was bad Stalin was bad Lenin was good and he declared the slogan like Khrushchev let's go back to Lenin let's go back to Lenin 
Okay, we're going to this sacred books of Leninism, which would be good. It would save us. But unlike Khrushchev, what he did, he said, um, we need to be uh, interested in NEP, new economic policies. Remember, in 1920s, Lenin defined his Bolshevik comrades, said, we need to give some limited space for the private enterprise, especially for the peasants in the countryside. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to produce anything. It's this, yes, compromise, horrible compromise, but we need to do it. But later, when we are strong enough, we might crack down on them, okay? But Lenin didn't set um, the time limits of when the communists needed to crack down on the peasants. Of course, we know that Stalin uh, did this in 1929 when he collectivized the Soviet countryside. But Lenin, in all fairness, did not put any deadlines. So that by the end of 1920s, we needed to crash um, peasant society. So uh, he encouraged Gorbachev, uh, the Soviet bosses, to read uh, writings of Lenin written in um, early 1920s before Lenin died. Okay, and he started uh, talking about uh, market, market socialism. So we needed to bring market somehow. Okay, particularly he started. Uh, Repeating this, um, Lenin's words about cooperatives. We need to create co-ops, co-ops and countryside co-ops and sell, resale, wholesale, retail business. Uh, so state should lift its control and create cooperatives because cooperatives for him became this um, safe outlet. Uh, on the one hand, he didn't talk about private enterprise. And in this case, he did not violate this communist virginity. But on the other hand, uh, talking about cooperatives allowed him to somehow gradually shut down this Stalinist state socialism. So it was like a middle ground. Cooperative, cooperative project was uh, to become this like a middle, middle ground for him, middle of the road approach. But still, he faced a bureaucratic resistance because communist bosses they were so entrenched into the system, they didn't want to um, quit their control of big enterprises, okay? In terms of glassness, openness, Gorbach openness Gorbachev concluded that uh, Soviet society might benefit by encouraging open criticism. Little did he know that by encouraging criticism, he actually contributed to this destruction of this very system. Okay, because any totalitarian or authoritarian state, as soon as you pull out one or two bricks from this building of this uh, authoritarian state, immediately begins to collapse. And that's exactly what happened with the Soviet Union. Um, let's um, uh, encourage free flow of information and ideas. Forbidden books were published, thousands of books that were forbidden in the Soviet Union suddenly were published and the Soviet Union became the most, it was actually a country that read more than any other countries. And that's what the Soviets boasted a lot. They said, we are the most reading country in the world, even before uh, Gorbachev reforms. Why? Because in the Soviet Union, there was hardly any room um, to have fun. There were uh, no room for entertainment, so the bar, there were a few bars and restaurants, you couldn't go to a restaurant, there, were, there was not much choice in movies, um, you could not um, have big uh, theater performances at the open air, so everything was controlled by the government, okay. Um, that is why reading TV was very disgusting, so you couldn't um, uh, watch anything because it was so dull. They reported about econ grand economic achievements of the Soviet Union, reported how many millions of uh, steel how uh, Soviet factories produced, how many uh, tons of grain they produced. So what kind of awards Soviet leaders re um, uh, received. So it was really, really dull. There were some occasionally well-made movies, but generally it was a very dull TV compared to the Western TV. Uh, 
That is why in um, West, on the Western board of the Soviet Union, a lot of people tried to tune themselves to the Finnish, Swedish TV, uh, <clears throat> to the, even to Polish TV, to a Hungarian TV, which was more fun to watch. So reading, to make a long story short, reading in this case created this outlet when people um, could have fun by simply reading books. And it became even more so on the Gorbachev when suddenly... Uh, all forbidden books were published. It was like a floodgate, floodgate of literature. This, uh, the gates were opened and a bunch of forbidden books were published. It was, of course, Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn, uh, books by Vladimir Nabokov, for instance, a Russian-American writer, for the first time was published in Russian. Uh, um, in 19, actually, 1989, 1989, uh, some uh, folks started even um, to openly sell self-published newspapers, okay? And the government closed its eyes on this. In international relations, Gorbachev continued Khrushchev's approach. He said, we don't need to um, uh, destroy the West. Yes, they are our ideological enemies, but at the same time, we have more in common with uh, Western people. We have uh, more uh, that unites us with the West than what divides us. How did he f uh, explain it? He said, look, in this, new, in this new age, class warfare propagated by traditional Marxism, when the poor against the rich, rich against the poor, and different classes um, should be involved in the mortal fight, and that the West embodies the exploiters, imperialists, the rich classes in uh, the East, the uh, Soviet Union and her allies was the symbol of uh, the poor people who were fighting against imperialist West. Gorbachev said, it's not relevant anymore for the end of the 20th century. Now we need to live by so-called new thinking. He said, we equally suffer from um, pollution, so we need to fight for a clean environment. We equally, we equally can suffer from a nuclear weapon. If, for instance, the West uses nuclear weapon on us or we use nuclear weapon on the West, everybody would suffer, both uh, capitalists and communists and whoever they could be. So we need to get rid of the class approach. We need to get rid of the class approach in international relationships. That's what he argued. That's what he told to his bureaucrats. And that was the message he sent to all uh, Soviet ideological apparatus that you need to get rid of this um, class war in international relationships. We need to talk more about peaceful coexistence to continue what Khrushchev started and what actually was um, done to a limited scale on the, um, the stagnation regime when Soviets did make some kind of... Uh, a few steps, uh, detente, detente, it's a relaxation of tension with the United States. So we need new thinking. But Gorbachev wanted to extend it. He said, let's not talk anymore about the class approach. This old Marxists talk about classes, the war of classes. So we need to stop it. Let's shut it down. So there are more important global issues than class interests. Okay. <clears throat> and another good thing what he did and that's what some present-day russians don't understand they blame him for this unfairly of course he withdrew soviet troops from afghanistan it was the killing war killing not only in terms of lives about thirty thousand soviet troops were killed in afghanistan and um, up to two million uh, afghan people suffered being killed wounded in this war. So he withdrew Soviet troops from Afghanistan, which saved a lot of money uh, for the Soviets. Okay, And of course, unfortunately, uh, the follow up to this um, withdrawal, uh, Taliban came to power as a reaction to the Soviet atheistic regime that had existed in um, Afghanistan. A, a fundamentalist regime of Taliban came to power in Afghanistan, and the rest is history, you know, the rise of uh, <clears throat> Muslim fundamentalism, uh, Al-Qaeda established her bases in Afghanistan. Um, Gorbachev denounced Af the Afghan war as illegal, immoral, 
okay and he also wanted to save money by cutting the soviet military by 10 percent. that is why soviet military hated him like they had hated khrushchev remember we mentioned this and the secret police also by the way came to hate gorbachev because uh, the military and the secret police they flourished in secrecy that was their life that was their bread and butter okay warfare secrecy um on his reform team i would like uh, to mention um two persons who were important to spearhead his reforms who were these people first boris yeltsin a would-be president of the russian federation uh, gorbachev brought him from siberia where yeltsin was a local communist party secretary in charge of uh, uh, one particular district of siberia he brought him to Moscow and made him uh, the chief of the Moscow Communist Party organization. So Moscow was the capital, as you know, of the Soviet Union. And the chief of the city party organization was a very important man. He was actually promoted to the status of candidate member of a Politburo. So he was one step away from becoming uh, the a Politburo member. Another one is more important man, I think, who was actually behind the scenes planning in fact planning uh, the perestroika and glasses so in case of this man we can say that he did have agenda he did have a plan um, although it was a vague plan but unlike gorbachev he already had this um, idea how this inefficient soviet economy should be reformed he was um, ironically uh, he was um, a man who was put by Gorbachev to be in charge of the communist ideology and he was the one who actually destroyed the communist ideology it was Alexander Yakovlev who in 1972 uh, fell out of favor with the uh, communist nomenclature why because he became involved uh, uh, into an argument with uh, uh, one of the chief communist bosses um, who tried to encourage um, this nationalistic aspirations uh, some kind of elements of russian nationalism within the soviet ideology and yakovlev said oh it's uh, quite dangerous uh, we shouldn't do it it's not the way to go and since uh, this uh, person had a wider network and influence so Yakovlev, uh, he wasn't kicked out because it was an argument within the bureaucracy about to put more emphasis on the Russian nationalism or not. I remember the building uh, that had been by Stalinism, this national Bolshevism that catered to the interests of Russians and um, some Soviet bureaucrats said, oh, we need to cater more to the Russians. We need to talk more about these Russian czars russian heroes and some bureaucrats who supported yakovlev they said no no we should talk more about cosmopolitan values of socialism because the message of socialism is cosmopolitan and we are actually cosmopolitan countries so there was this argument within the soviet leadership and yakovlev uh, lost this argument and um, uh, the way to depose him was to appoint him um, uh, the ambassador to canada so he became the ambassador to canada and it happened in 1970s so through through the 1970s and until um, 1985 so for 15 years he was um, the soviet ambassador in canada so he was um, deeply exposed to the western culture intellectual culture okay to uh, not only to the western intellectual culture to the north american intellectual culture he had a lot of time to read forbidden books and eventually he had this plan to reform socialism so to he was already a person who had this a project to uh, build a market socialism in the soviet union he also had this idea to destroy the monopoly power of the communist party in the soviet union okay of course originally he didn't think either about um, destroying um, socialism altogether he was thinking about market socialism, maybe something to create in Soviet Union, something that uh, had existed in Yugoslavia. So maybe even more like um, in Yugoslavia, they still had the one party state. But he was thinking, Yakolev, about multi-party system, about um, uh, freedom of press, uh, 
and um, he read, of course, Archip Gulag Archipelago. He had uh, he read some Western philosophers, political thinkers. So it was a good um, long-term perspective. It was a good decision to appoint him because Yakovlev quickly made reforms to demolish communist ideology. He became actually the architect of Gorbachev reforms. He was. He was the one to talk about cooperatives. He kind of instilled this idea in Gorbachev's mind, cooperatives. He was the one to turn Gorbachev's mind to NEP. Okay. He also asked Gorbachev to extend Khrushchev destalinization. He said, we need to denounce Stalinism. And um, prompted by Yakovlev, Gorbachev goes public for the first time since Khrushchev. Uh, he goes public in November 1987, when um, the Soviet celebrated the anniversary of uh, the October Revolution, 1987. It's a important date, and he actually openly stated that we need to uh, demolish Stalinism. He actually used this word Stalinism, which had been never used. Even Khrushchev didn't use this word, but Gorbachev decided to use this word. He said we need to denounce Stalinism, we, we need to root out Stalinism, we need to uh, denounce collectivization that was deadly, that led to numerous uh, deaths, and everybody was shocked, I repeat, the year is 1987, that's when Gorbachev uh, went full ahead with his reforms, okay, 1987, a very important date. <clears throat> So, Corpse 1987 uh, were declared as the way to go, and um, people on the ground were uh, given a green light to create corps, like um, corps to what? To manufacture clothing, to repair cars. And of course, it became a signal for all kinds of enterprising people to create private companies under the car of these corps. So, essentially, it was an excuse for to legalize uh, private enterprises on the ground when some people who were able to accumulate some money at the black market they set up so-called corps but in fact you know, private enterprises private diners private restaurants or you know, private workshops any kind of uh, enterprise family businesses or private businesses i had a friend for instance who set up in a, in the basement of an abandoned building a textile factory. There was a huge basement and he hired 100 people, um, men and women. He paid them and they manufactured three, they worked three shifts, like sweat labor. They And he worked with them too, you know, staying there, sleeping there. You know? <laughs> and uh, it was called cooperative. All, in reality, it was a private enterprise, he paid these ladies, they manufactured clothing, and his wife of this uh, friend of mine, he established a um, uh, delivery network, distributing these pieces of clothing uh, to their friends who were selling it to uh, other people. Okay? And eventually stores were established. So in, uh, this friend of mine established a store where they started to sell this clothing. Okay. Um, Occasionally, some private farms were created, or co of course, co-ops, we would say, it, but not my, not many, because unfortunately, um, Russian and Ukrainian peasants as well, especially in eastern Ukraine, were totally, um, I would say, uh, the spirit of enterprise was eliminated by the decades of uh, collectivization. Only in western Ukraine it survived, because western Ukraine was only recently uh, included in the Soviet Union in 1945-1946. Uh, but in the rest of the Soviet Union, uh, in the countryside, the spirit of enterprise in the countryside was killed, unfortunately. So even at the present day, not many private farms exist in the Soviet Union. Okay, But still, there were high taxes on corps. Land, land was not allowed for sale. Gorbachev was... Uh, petrified to make this state to allow people to sell and resell the land. So these people who either built some kind of a, a workshop or factory, they had to rent land or those few private farm cooperative farms that had been created, they had to rent la uh, their land from the government. Okay. Unfortunately, big Soviet industrial plants continued to work and continued to work 
and follow the regime of quotas, which was bizarre. Okay. And he was afraid to make the step to dismantle these enterprises. And I understand him. Why? Because if, for instance, all these inefficient factories, including military factories, would have been closed right away, it would have meant millions of unemployed people. And he was petrified to make this state. So we need to understand him. It wasn't so easy to kind of orchestrated this creative destruction. So as you know, economists after Joseph Schumpeter, they call this uh, natural uh, demolition, natural bankruptcy of enter inefficient enterprises, which produced, which produced items which nobody needs. Uh, they call economists uh, creative destruction. But in the Soviet Union, it could have been such a huge creative destruction. It potentially would have been a huge discontent and that's exactly what happened eventually so there was no way to win this war okay a lot of people had to go because some of the soviet enterprises not some of them but um, a huge part of them at least 70 percent of them were so inefficient so unproductive they produ they produced items which nobody needed and many of these factories could not compete with the western enterprises okay <clears throat> Interesting, what Western experts thought about the Soviet prospects when Gorbachev in 1987 declared his uh, uh, policy of reforms. Ironically, many Western experts, they didn't think about what soon would happen. Nobody could predict the Soviet Union would fall apart. Okay, Both uh, left ex experts on the left and experts on the right, they didn't realize. 90% of them, including CIA, by the way, they uh, never thought that Soviet Union would uh, uh, break apart. Only Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was a former national security advisor for Jimmy Carter in, uh, at the end of 1970s, he actually predicted that socialism, uh, Soviet Union would fall apart and 15 republics that would become independent countries. Interesting uh, prophecy, I guess it happened by chance. You cannot predict you know, the future, of course. It just happened by chance that Brzezinski was able to uh, do it, although he were, his was an educated guess. But the majority of Western experts, including intelligence services, they couldn't predict the breakup of the Soviet Union. And I would like to um, draw attention to three major experts, like Paul Samuelson, Samuelson. Um, one of the famous, um, a Nobel laureate, um, a famous Western economist, U.S. economist, who uh, was a Keynesian, so like a follower of John Keynes, uh, mi mixing a little bit of socialism, a bit of communism, um, regulation, uh, um, Joseph Krugman type guy, okay, like currently, you know, Joseph Krugman, who writes ops for new york times so paul samuelson was on the same plane and his book was used for decades by students at economics departments to learn about the economy so he thought that uh, soviet union um, and i mentioned it last time by the way he meant uh, he said that soviet union would outdo the united states soon that was his prophecy educated prophecy stephen cohen uh, who can be called the left uh, proponent of so-called democratic socialism. He wrote for The Nation magazine. It's a leftist magazine in the United States, um, popular magazine among the left. Um, in fact, he is a rich man. He is a very trust baby who has um, inherited a um, uh, huge trust. So he sponsors a lot of uh, left courses in the United States, Stephen Cohen, and some scholarships for students, he and his wife. Um, so he wrote a book um, about Bukharin, one of the Stalin, one of the Lenin's uh, uh, comrades, uh, eliminated by Stalin, as we know. And um, in this book, he uh, propagated this NEP policy, that NEP, this market socialism, that would be the way of the future. Socialism would be saved through this market socialism. And he was actually popular, extremely popular among um, people who were around Gorbachev. So he was welcome to the Gorbachev Soviet Union. His book about Bukharin was uh, 
published, uh, translated into Russian, published. He was interviewed. So he became like a minor celebrity, Stephen Cohen. So Stephen Cohen said what Gorbachev was doing, it was a natural uh, evolution of socialism. He said Gorbachev uh, socialism with a human face. And that's what exactly Gorbachev said. He repeated this Prague Spring slogan. He said, we're going to build socialism with a human face. The words of Gorbachev, repeating the Czech communists. And after him, Stephen Cohen said, that's the way of the future. So Soviet Union would evolve into a nice democratic socialist society. Um, state socialism would be eliminated and it would be a nice humane society. And of course, as we know, his prophecy, prophecy didn't materialize. On the uh, right side, on conservative side, there was uh, Richard Pipes, whose name I mentioned. He is the he is a historian, by the way, historian who taught at Yale, Yale University for many years. He wrote a, a really good book called um, uh, "Communist Revolution," "Communist Revolution" about Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. So, if you want to read his books, Google this name but at the same time he was he issued a flawed prophecy he said listen um i'm not joking he said that what gorbachev tried to do it's a huge plot it's like a kgb conspiracy conspiracy of the soviet police to dupe the united states so we should be really wary of this we should be very suspicious of what gorbachev was doing in the soviet union because it's like a grand plot of the soviets to deceive the united states to make somehow the united states open to build the bridges and that's how the soviets eventually would cheat they would use american credits they try to extract extract american technology uh and in fact you know, what gorbachev was doing would strengthen would strengthen <laughs> soviet socialism which didn't uh come through of course okay so he was um, it was a big mistake on his part to kind of issue this uh, conspiracy notion that it was a grand kgb conspiracy okay um gorbachev realized that attacks against dissidents there were some dissidents remember we talked about dissidents uh last time uh, people who decided to put their careers online going against the soviet regime who were uh, harassed by the government, put either in mental hospitals or occasionally confined to um, prison for two, three years, not severely penalized as under Stalin, but still some people were put in prison for several years. Um, one of the major icons of the dissident movement was Andrei Sakharov, remember, nuclear physicist who was exiled by the Soviets to a closed city named Gorky, Gorky in central Russia, where he lived literally under house arrest. Uh, Gorbachev decided to release these, these um, uh, people, dissidents. There were about um, 100 plus something dissidents in the Soviet Union. Some of them were in mental hospitals, some of them were in prison. So he released them. Or release them and one of the first people to be released was Andrei Sakharov in fact Gorbachev himself called Sakharov and said I welcome you back and I would like your advice which was a really courageous step it's un unbelievable and I, I couldn't believe my ears when I heard this over TV at that time it was so unusual <clears throat> At first, it was um, 100 plus something, but then more political prisoners were released. And from 1986 to 1987, there were 400 political prisoners were were released. Not right away, I repeat, but in the process of uh, it took one year for them to be released. Okay. And finally, immigration from the Soviet Union was allowed because before, as you know, Soviet Union was a closed country. You couldn't freely travel, like getting a passport and traveling for a tourist trip. You, you, were, you were allowed to go to a tourist trip if your family members uh, were kept as hostages <laughs> to guarantee that you would not escape. And abroad, you were not allowed as a Soviet tourist to go alone. Okay? You had to be part of a group. 
because to keep an eye on you, you know, and <clears throat> people were encouraged to report on each other. That was the way to guarantee loyalty. For the first time, um, Gorbachev allowed the Soviet people to travel individually to other countries. And it was done in 1988. In 1988, for the first time, uh, Soviet um, Interior Ministry, its uh, domestic police, issued, um, following their orders from Gorbachev, they issued a memo to allow people to make individual trips abroad. So, And I was one of those beneficiaries who took a trip. I went uh, to Switzerland on my own, alone, in, uh, in 19, 1989. And it was just uh, unbelievable. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was ready to pinch myself. Um, it was a stunning experience. Experience. In fact, it was really a shocking experience. I would have, uh, I would have preferred to go to some other country, like maybe to a less developed country, to for me to have a transition. Because from to uh, be uh, uh, beamed from the Soviet Union to Switzerland, which uh, I repeat, the, the more sophisticated, the more advanced in, than the United States. It was just, it was a shocking experience to see those high living standards, to see the houses, um, all these small things like uh, billboards, the way the life was organized. It, it, was, it was shocking. I couldn't, the first three days I, um, I, I, I could not, I just walked, um, the streets and looked around that was like a museum the entire zurich it was zurich the city where this conference was i went for a conference 1989 in july and it was a shocking experience so censorship anyway going back to what was going on in the soviet union censorship was finally abandoned and by doing this gorbachev opened this pandora's box again remember this expression pandora's box so he thought he would improve the uh, the system of uh, socialism, but in in fact, he started to indirectly to demolish the building of Soviet socialism, because people quickly, from attacking Stalin, they started to attack Lenin, which hadn't happened under Khrushchev. Remember, under Khrushchev, they established limits of criticism. Now, people started to move further and further. When remember, it's like um, an old uh, fairy tale when you give. A, ch a children fairy tale. When you give um, a mouse a cookie, it will ask for a, a cup of milk. When you give a ma mouse a cup of milk, it will ask for a piece of cheese and <laughs> further and further. That's what happened with the Soviets. So they started to extend um, uh, the borders of uh, permitted and eventually started asking questions why Stalin became possible and of course the most brave people within the Soviet Union start, started arguing hey Stalin became possible because of Lenin Lenin opened the doors to Stalin okay and soon the entire uh, system of Soviet socialism one was under criticism and for some people uh, who were on the right it gave uh, option to legalize the Russian Orthodox Church, which was coming to the light, to fill the void created by the demolition of communism. So the communist ideology was going down because it was so bankrupt, it was so unpopular that nobody wanted to have it. So the Russian Orthodox Church started to come in to fill in this void, okay? Not for everybody, but for a huge chunk of uh, people. Okay, and a lot of in that why that is why it is bizarre uh, what you could observe at that time. Some former communist bosses they declared themselves Russian Orthodox. Okay, former communist bureaucrats who repeated this mantra of socialism because they had to parrot uh, the dominant ideology. As you know, we are opportunists by nature. So East or West, it doesn't matter. Everywhere people, unfortunately, opportunists, they try to plug in. And those communists on the ground, the communist bosses or ideologists who were chatting, chickering, um, repeating mantra of socialism, now suddenly made a turnaround and said, hey, Russian Orthodox Church is a great thing. So we need to revive this. Communist, communist was bad and the true ideology of Russians was uh, 
Russian Orthodox Church. And of course, a similar thing happened in Muslim republics of the Soviet Union, where some local communist voices started to promote Islam. Okay, and many of them were actually um, pledged allegiance to Islam anyway, you know, in the family relations, you know, so it was quick for them to do it. But um, for many, I repeat, and I need to emphasize this, but it was not necessarily um, uh, Russian Orthodox Church or Islam in case of uh, Central Asian republics. The most popular ideology and it was a secular ideology they, that came to fill the minds of uh, local bureaucrats, communist voices, local communist ideologies. It was nationalism. So nationalism. Sometimes it was tinged with the Russian Orthodox religion a bit. But normally for the majority, I repeat, for the majority of population, for the majority of the communist voices, it was the most popular ideology that filled the void was nationalism. Nationalism nationalism we need to emphasize this and i did not emphasize this bullet point but we need to stress this because and it was natural because um willy-nilly by preaching um uh, sharing communism socialism communist ideologies and part of the populace they instilled in the minds the spirit of atheism okay this a skeptical attitude to religion. So even those who embraced, for opportunistic re reasons, the Russian Orthodox, Orthodox, Orthodox Church, they still were you know, pretty much atheists because they were raised in the spirit of atheism. That is why it was handy for them to switch to nationalism, which was simply a, a secular ideology, nationalism. So our um, Russian tribe, our um, or Ukrainian tribe, whatever, or Estonian tribes, so all these local communist bureaucrats, they quickly started to preach their local nationalisms. And um, socialism by its own nature uh, was preaching collectivism. So people should be together, the poor against the rich. But since this cosmopolitan socialism became bankrupt, so nationalism that came to fill the void neatly, substituted for socialism again it became a new type of collectivism which simply replaced uh, this cosmopolitan version of uh, socialism still it was collectivism so nationalism was a natural outlet for many people and in case other of other so-called socialist countries like in hungary in poland in czechoslovakia especially in yugoslavia also local um, communist bosses they also embraced nationalism in addition to uh, local religions in case of serbians again orthodox church in case of um, albanians it was islam of course um their reform made reforms made by gorbachev and his allies in uh, Soviet leadership were interpreted by people in Eastern Europe as invitation for direct attacks against communism. Okay, because all these uh, nations felt captive, held hostages by the Soviet communists. So in 1989, from down below, people started to revolt against communism. And Gorbachev said, "We don't want to stop this." So he sent a message to his um, security, his secret police bureaucrats and soviet military do not interfere okay soon in poland this independent labor union comes to power interesting experience solidarity remember solidarity when workers in the uh, polish shipyards in 1970 and then in 1980 they made attempts to create independent labor union independent from the communist uh, regime okay and now this labor union came to power and this electrician from a local shipyard named Lech Walesa became the first independently elected president of Poland. In Hungary, Communist Party simply disbanded itself. We don't want to be in power anymore. So which opened the doors to uh, establishing a, re a republic in Hungary. Again, Gorbachev washed his hands. I'm not going to interfere, which was good. So he didn't want to repeat Khrushchev's um, experience by sending tanks to Hungary or something. Um, in Czechoslovakia, there was bloodless Velvet Revolution when a dissident, a guy who was like a 
Andrei Sakharov, who was also exiled, uh, kept under house arrest, named Václav Havel, a very popular dissident. He was elected the president. Communist Party was disbanded. The, the, um, the toughest regimes to go away were Eastern Germany, where communist leadership at first didn't want to go. They denounced, in, in fact, they didn't like what Gorbachev was doing. Uh, but people on the ground revolted against um, Gorbachev. Uh, mass demonstrations, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, started to chant Gorby, 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 we want Gorby. <laughs> so the communist leadership didn't know what to do. Okay? And as soon the crowd of people attacked the Berlin Wall, November 1989, demolished it. And you probably saw in the History Channel these, um, uh, these uh, uh, footage when how the Berlin Wall was demolished. And eventually the grassroots revolt in Eastern Germany swept away, washed away the communist leadership. The bloodiest fight took place in Romania when Ceausescu, a local dictator who actually kept a distance away from the Soviets, he was like a national socialist. He built his own version of communism called Romanian communism. He declared himself the genius of Carpathian mountains. That was his title of this Romanian dictator. I repeat, the title was The Genius of Carpathian Mountains. So he said that um, unlike the Soviets, Chinese, whatever, we in Romania, we are building our own communist dictatorship. So Ceausescu didn't want to go away. Um, but when people all over Eastern Europe started to revolt against communism, uh, it so happened that uh, during one of the uh, public speeches which he delivered in front of a huge crowd in, in inside the crowd that gathered in Bucharest the capital of uh, Romania some people st ch ch started to chant go away go away go away and he couldn't understand what was going on and then when other people joined spontaneously the whole crowd started to chant go away go away go away so in disgust he retreated and then ordered secret police to shoot at these people so we had um, uh, a couple of days of bloody fight between Romanian secret police and some of the troops that joined the crowd that revolted against the communist regime. And eventually, Ceausescu, Nicolae Ceausescu and his uh, wife Helena Ceausescu were captured by the rebels and were executed, uh, executed on the spot. Okay, it was a very bloody, bloody event. Uh, so the only... Uh, Bloody, although not the only. I have to be, I have to be uh, exact. Uh, in the same year, 1989, in China, students also um, revolted against the communist regime, and thousands of them went to Tiananmen Square in summer. And by the way, it happened during the Gorbachev visit to China. So many Chinese students interpreted this visit as an invitation to make reforms. And the Chinese communist leadership was petrified that something like in the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe could happen. They were petrified to watch these footage from Romania when people executed this uh, communist dictator. So there was a debate within the uh, Chinese uh, communist government, how to respond to this uh, uh, thousands of demonstrators that went to uh, this Beijing square called Tiananmen Square to demand democracy. Some of them um, shouted the same slogan, Gorbi, Gorbi, Gorbi. Others went further. O others carried the effigy of uh, um, Statue of Liberty. <laughs> demanding more so we need democracy we need freedom of press elections and eventually in china the tough uh, communist uh, faction prevailed and they forced the rest to abide and um, deng xiaoping uh, the guy who declared economic reforms in china eventually decided not to do any political reforms in china okay As tanks were sent against uh, the Chinese students, and they were executed. They were killed, executed. And to the present day, it is forbidden in China to talk about this demonstration, that you could be thrown into prison. Okay, So economic reforms uh, had been done in China, but to the present day, uh, 
the country was not reformed politically. The Communist Party is still in power in China. There is no freedom of press. There is no freedom of speech, as you know. China formally is still a communist country, okay? Which reminds this NEP building, like top of the uh, pyramid of power belongs to the Communist Party, but the bottom is capitalist. So it's a state capitalism controlled by the Communist state. It's interesting, interesting uh, structure. <clears throat> anyway, let's uh, go back to the Soviet Union. Um, in response to this um, uh, demolition of the communist building, gradual di dissolution of power, decentralization of power, we have the rise of nationalities within the Soviet Union. Within these 15 republics, local communist bo bosses started to feel empowered. They said, hey, we need to take more and more power because we see that uh, the whole building is going down. Okay, One of the first <coughs> sparks of this um, uh, invitation to the rise of, I would say, uh, national, local national socialism was Kazakhstan affair. When Gorbachev deposed a local indigenous corrupt communist boss who was guilty in taking bribes, so he uh, meant business by kicking him out, okay? One during the crackdown, original crackdown continuing this undrop of policy of cracking down on corrupt communist bosses. But since this boss, communist boss, was an indigenous one, students, Kazakh students, went to the streets uh, demonstrating against ousting this boss because Gorbachev appointed the Russian to replace him. And that's what upset local indigenous uh, folks, intellectuals. So it's, see, even though the boss was corrupt and the guy who was appointed to replace him was a clean who didn't take bribes. It triggered this um, nationalist revolt in Kazakhstan. Okay, and eventually people went further and further. In Baltic republics, everything went out of control because communism was never popular there. These countries were artificially, remember, included in the Soviet Union. Very late, 1945-46, there was a strong underground resistance against the Soviets until 1955 the so-called forest fighters, nationalists, Estonian, Lithuanian, Latvian nationalists who were fighting against the Soviet troops. It's like in Western Ukraine, where we had, uh, until 1955, we have a uh, Ukrainian Liberation Army fighting against the Soviet secret police troops. You know, there was a, such a hatred of Soviet communism because it was imposed on, on the people. So these uh, parts of the Soviet Union quickly uh, moved away uh, in the uh, Caucasus Mountains, there was a fight between Azeri people and Armenians uh, when two nations realized the Soviet Union was going down and they needed to mark the future borders of their states. And it happened in 1988. So local nationalists already felt that the whole building of the Soviet Union was going down. So that is why they started to... Um, mark the borders, the future borders between the two uh, would-be states, which triggered the conflict between Azeri people and Armenians who were arguing about one small area that was given by the Soviet leadership to Armenia, okay, uh, under Soviet Union. It's like Crimea, uh, the area uh, populated by Russians, predominantly Russians, that was given by Khrushchev to Ukraine. Okay, and now it was taken by the Russian Federation, which triggered this international conflict and eventually a war between Ukraine and Russia. So something like this happened in between Azerbaijan and Armenia when the Soviet leadership gave to Armenia one small Azeri area. And Armenians, of course, claimed that Azeri claimed that in that's what triggered the fight between these two nations. As early as 1988, before, before the Soviet Union was disbanded, okay? So, reason I want to stress this is that um, the fate of the Soviet Union was essentially sealed, okay? Gorbachev opened, as I said, Pandora's box. There was no way to stop this natural demolition of uh, this, the last empire called the Soviet Empire, okay? Gorbachev simply... Um, went, went along with the flow of events. You know, he was not a strong leader. He simply followed the flow of uh, events that were unfolding on the ground. Okay.
Gorbachev could not understand where he should go, in fact, because he was unsure. And he started to, like a cat when in front of a car, that he was jumping back and forth, back and forth, and eventually he was destroyed and ran over by the events, you know. Um, on the one hand, he gave a green light to people like Alexander Yakolev to do this um, reforms. Uh, Yeltsin, he brought Yeltsin, as I said, who wanted to do reforms too. But on the other hand, the conservatives and the communist leadership said, oh, you go too much, you might destroy socialism. And that is why he decided to throw the bone to the conservatives in the communist party. He fired Yeltsin from his position of Moscow Communist Party boss. And, but Yeltsin um, denounced Gorbachev in response. He said, OK, I'm stepping down, but I'm becoming a dissident. So I would be in charge of this democratic movement. And that's what eventually happened. So Yeltsin was put in charge of a like spontaneously spontaneous movement called Democratic Russia that was growing underground, supported by intellectuals, some workers, okay, former dissidents or mostly Soviet intellectuals and some workers called Democratic Russia. Um, so chaos was growing. Soviet Union started to fall apart. Uh, Soviet economy stopped functioning. On the one hand, he didn't allow the private enterprise to fully flourish. On the other hand, he did not demolish, he didn't want to demolish inefficient, central, uh, centralized Soviet economy. So uh, when you don't know which way you go, you actually contribute to the entire uh, collapse, economic collapse. And that's what happened in the last days, last years of the Soviet Union. So the situation became worse than under stagnation. OK, so we did have short, we could see some uh, shortages on the uh, Brezhnev, last years of Brezhnev. But now entire distribution system, entire uh, economy was falling apart Okay, because black market was expanding. On the one hand, we have centralized planning quota system, uh, people uh, who worked in the food um, stores they started to hoard goods and trying to sell them on the black market uh, national income dropped 10 percent food shortages everywhere everything disappeared from stores so under brezhnev there was still some items available in stores okay because the country for better or for worse was controlled an efficient system yes that's still there were some uh, basic food items that were available in stores now everything disappeared except some I don't know, don't ask me why, except some uh, canned seaweeds and mango juice. That's what I remember, seaweeds and mango juice. Even bread disappeared. So everything went to the black market, was sold in the black market. Um, eventually, Alexander Yakovlev said, we need to demolish monopoly of the Communist Party. So he, on the one hand, he threw the bone to conservatives. On the other hand, he followed advice of Alexander Yakovlev that we need to eliminate the monopoly power of the communist party and that's what they did that's what they did they said they changed the soviet constitution where they wrote that communist party was not anymore this navigating force that navigates the soviet society we can allow other political parties to flourish it would it would uh, as the constitution said it would strengthen the building of soviet socialism which was bizarre of course because people by using their freedom demolish this uh, building of Soviet socialism okay <clears throat> but on the other hand he was afraid of this nationalist movement in their uh, Soviet um, uh, republics and to show that he meant business he decided to crack down on Lithuanian independence when Lithuanians declared on their own independence from the Soviet Union he uh, closed his eyes on uh, detachment he actually uh, to the present day, it wasn't clear who made this decision. Some people argued that he made this decision. Other people said it wasn't his decision. It was simply uh, endorsement of this decision. A detachment of Soviet paratroopers was sent to seize the uh, Lithuanian television, major Lithuanian newspapers, and crack down Lithuanian independence to kind of send a signal to local um, communist elites that we are not going to encourage this uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. 
and these Soviet paratroopers killed 15 people who uh, there were hundreds of people who came to defend the Lithuanian television, the major Lithuanian newspapers, and these paratroopers killed about 15 people. Okay, and um, thousands of people went to the streets in Moscow to demonstrate against this killing, mass killing. So it provoked provoked a huge discontent within the within Russia proper, Moscow, St. Petersburg, okay, and eventually Gorbachev had to back up. He said, oh, I didn't send these people, okay. <clears throat> At the same time, he rejected the radical reform, so see, the person didn't know what he was doing. Eventually, Lithuania and Georgia, Georgia it's, um, uh, was a republic in the Caucasus, uh, one of this republics in the Caucasus mountains, declared the independence, we go away from the Soviet Union, we don't want to do we didn't we don't want to have anything to do with you so these were the first two republics to declare independence lithuania and georgia eventually uh in 1991 in august 1991 the soviet leadership makes the last attempt to stop this process of disintegration, the hardliners in the Soviet Union made a weak attempt, I repeat, a weak attempt when Gorbachev goes to a uh, resort area in Crimea, by the way, it happened, it happened in Crimea, goes to vacation, they wanted to repeat this Khrushchev option uh, to de declare that he wasn't able to perform his duties because of his illness. So actually Gorbachev was put under house arrest and uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Soviet Interior, uh, the KGB chief, uh, the Soviet Army chief decided to depose him. But when they declared, they went on TV, declared that they're going to de declare emergency situation. They're going to send troops and tanks to keep an order. And the Gorbachev was not able to perform his duties. So by all uh, in major Soviet cities, it was interpreted as a coup, and it was a coup. In Moscow and St. Petersburg, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people went to the streets. Troops sent against people, refused to go against the people. They started to hug each other, and eventually the coup, uh, the coup failed. You know, nobody wanted to listen, the leaders of the coup, and Yeltsin, who was um, uh, in charge of this movement, against the coup was declared uh, the leader and eventually he was elected the president of russia okay <clears throat> unfortunately unfortunately most of the soviet citizens stood on the sidelines okay they observed what who would prevail who would prevail it was only in st petersburg in russia proper in st petersburg and moscow people who um went to demonstrate and i remember how in my city where i taught samar um, nobody went to protest so people were sitting like on the on the fence and waiting what would happen in some big cities uh, in soviet republics people interpreted this as a uh, invitation to go against this uh, coup and to take power into their national hands okay but in um, uh, within the Russia, it was only in a few cities where people went to demonstrate. I repeat, mostly in Saint Peter in capital cities, mostly in Saint Petersburg and Moscow. That's where hundreds of thousands of people decided the fate of the coup. Okay, <clears throat> but the rest of Russia, unfortunately, did not. Uh, I repeat, in Russia proper, did not um, actively support these demonstrators. Only coal miners, coal miners in southern Russia went on strike against the coup. But in these 15 republics, in 15 republics, local nationalist elite said, OK, so we need to get out of the Soviet Union as soon as possible to consolidate our power. So it was an uh, invitation for local elites to go national, to go national. So that is why, uh, in addition to Lithuania and Georgia, quickly, the rest of 15, uh, 13 republics declared uh, move toward independence and eventually when Yeltsin was elected the president of Russia uh, they declared the independence and it happened in December 1991 so all republics declared eventually independence Russia proper uh, 
to declare her independence. Yeltsin, who was in charge of this democratic movement, was also declared the president as a result of elections. And Gorbachev <laughs> suddenly found himself a, pr a president without a country. So his country that he presided over disappeared. We need to give him credit. He decided not to stick to his power. He simply said, okay, so my country doesn't exist. I have to go. And uh, we, can, we need to give him credit. He could have, like Ceausescu, he could have resisted organizing some kind of failed coups. Of course, these coups w would have failed and hardly anybody would, would have supported him anyway. But again, he decided to go in peace and he said, the Soviet Union was gone. I'm not the president of this uh, communist country anymore. And that was the end of the Soviet Union, this, the last empire, the communist empire, December 1991. Uh, and that was it. So next time we are going to discuss what happened in Russia after December 1991. So how the new leadership took over. Again, we are going to talk about Russia proper, the country that was stripped of uh, 15 republics. So now we have 15 independent countries. So that was an interesting event in, in world history. So now we have uh, uh, new countries. Instead of Soviet Union, we have a bunch of new countries, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, you name them. I don't even show you the other countries in Central Asia. Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Georgia here in Caucasus Mountains, Armenia, okay, a bunch of independent countries. Uh, as I repeat, uh, nothing connected them except some basic Russian they used in their mutual communication because culturally they were so different. There was hardly anything in common between uh, between a European country named uh, Estonia and uh, Kazakhstan or Georgia. There was hardly anything in common. Totally different countries, totally different societies. And now it was natural for them to go their separate ways. So that is why sometimes I don't understand this argument made some Russians, people who live in Russia that have nostalgia for old Soviet Union. They said, oh, the Soviet Union could have been saved. I think there's a general trend in our world. People go local, people go horizontal, and all these big empires or some artificial states uh, united by some uh, artificial connections, they tend to uh, go local. Okay, Even some uh, loosely united uh, unions like European Union, even within this union, we see this movement of the people to go local which I think, from my viewpoint, a global trend against globalism. It started in uh, early on, at the end of uh, the last century. That would be the end of the story for today. I will see you next time. Thank you for your attention.